Hi, I'm Mike. Welcome to my Waffle Square, where I obsess about things and you get to benefit from it. Well, in episode five of our ongoing series where we are rehabbing this 2006 Land Rover LR3 with the V8 petrol engine, we are going to be replacing the front struts and then we're gonna use the gap tool to calibrate the entire suspension system. So in the previous episode, we serviced the three valve blocks after discovering a significant leak out of the central one by the air compressor. Speaking of the air compressor, we also discovered it had the wrong firmware and we updated that with the gap ID tool. And doing both of those things brought us to the point where we are now with an operating air suspension system that's capable of lifting the vehicle all the way up to the off-road height, as well as bringing it back down again. Now, speaking of the previous episode, we had some really great comments that I wanted to highlight. First off, Jerry says, I wonder if you have an idea of how much it would cost to buy the three valve blocks versus the cost of the O-rings and the amount of time it took you to switch them out. Gary, as I promised in my reply, great question. The total cost for three basic no-name valve blocks would be $154 before tax. Next would be a correction I need to make brought to my attention by CLT Rovers who pointed out that the item I stated was the outdoor temperature sensor is in fact the TPMS or tire pressure monitoring sensor. Thank you very much for that correction and I appreciate everyone who uh, dropped a comment. Now, while we're praising comments, shout out to Gary, who's very observant. He noticed that on the gap tool, it was reading the battery on our LR3 is down to 11.7 volts and recommended I get a battery maintainer. Gary, cheers to you. Now, after we got the air suspension to lift us all the way up to its max height, which is the off-road height, it was time to do an overnight check of the entire air system. But to do that, you need to pull the fuses and the relay so that the system isn't trying to level itself all night long and you come out and find the whole vehicle down rather than one particular spot or front or back. Now, you can't just pull the relay like I had seen in a previous video. In fact, if you look at this picture here, I recommend you take out the relay and these three fuses. I'm not sure which of the fuses uh, is the actual one that is uh, governing the system and causing the vehicle to level out. If someone knows, they can put it in the comments for all of us. I just went ahead and took them all out. And here's what happened the next morning. So I let the vehicle sit overnight. And as you can see, there is a dramatic difference between the front and the rear. So uh, the rear suspension has not dropped at all but the front is completely bottomed out. Which would explain why I'm sitting on a chair, because if I stand up, my head's out of the shot. So I put the fuses back in, started her back up, lifted everything, and I found what I believe to be the culprit. Here's something gurgling in there. Sounds like the passenger side front air strut has a leak. Well, since the one air strut is bad and it seems like all of our air struts are the originals, we might as well replace them both. All right, quick word about air struts. So if all you're doing to fix up your LR3 is replacing uh, the front struts, then you might wanna consider the r knots, which are top of the line. But a pair of those for the front are $708 currently. I instead, because of all the other stuff we've got going on, elected to get this pair by Max Speeding Rods. They were $278 and they had really good reviews. So. A couple things about these that I like, uh, you get all new bolts that are gonna mount them up towards the top of the vehicle, plus you get a brand new brass fitting with the brand new O-ring. If you recall from our last episode with all the valve blocks, it was the O-rings that were giving us problems. So I really like that you get the same brass fitting. All right, without further ado, let's get started. Back up on the quick jack. 
Now, as always, I'm not a mechanic. I just dress like one on YouTube. So you're just coming along for the ride to see how I'm doing it. Let's first talk about safety. So right between the wheel well and the front passenger side is the valve block. If you watched the last video, you know it well. So we want to relieve the pressure from both struts that we're changing out. So there's two ways of doing that. Number one, we can come here to the valve block and we can loosen the green one on the bottom and the black one on the top and relieve any pressure that might be in there. Or we can go to the gap tool. And as you see here, you go to service test, suspension, and then deflate all, or you can deflate certain sides. And that way, you know, you're not gonna be blasted in the face. All right, with the wheel lock, we can get our bearings. So right in the center of our screen is the air strut we're gonna be taking off. There is a bolt down there that is holding the lower end in place. So that's one thing we need to take off. And then all the way up top, you can see we have the uh, three bolts and then the green airline is right back there. All right, you will find that a couple of shots of PB Blaster with a break in between will be greatly helpful to make this bolt here loose. This nut right here is 15 16 The corresponding bolt head on the other side is 21 millimeters. So you might find it helpful, as you see here, to put a long wrench on the other side that you can um, pin against the frame to help you get this bolt here off. But in our case, the PB Blaster has done a really good job. All right, I've got a uh, long bar here. Let's see if we can get it going. Oh yeah, that's really easy. Please use the PB Blaster. All right, it's sufficiently loose. We're going to knock this most of the way, but not all the way out for now. It'll just make it easier after we uh, remove the three 15 millimeter bolts on top uh, to pull this guy out if it's already started now. So the easiest and quickest way to get to that back bolt on top of the air strut is to remove this aluminum heat shield right here. And it's super easy because it's just one screw. And there's a couple tabs right here holding it in place. And now you can see straight down here to that bolt. And so I got a 15 millimeter socket with a uh, couple of extensions on it. This one here has kind of a round tip that allows it to wobble and it makes it really convenient for getting into these kind of off-center spots. And there we go. Easy. And while I'm up here, I'm gonna reach down and I'm going to just break loose the brass airline fitting with this uh, box end wrench. All right, these front two uh, 15 millimeter bolts are pretty easy to get to. You just need a, like a long 15 millimeter wrench. Those, those come right off. You might need to put PB Blaster on those depending on what part of the world you're in how much rust and salt you have. But here in Las Vegas, this guy has been bone dry, just really hot. All right, now down below, uh, right in the lower arm where there's a gap and you can lower this air strut down, I've placed the jack that's lowered about this same height as this piece right here that's holding the air strut in at the top. That way I can just lower it just enough to get my 12 millimeter wrench in there and do the final removing of the airline. 
I don't want to lower it all the way down and start getting to it when it's tight because I'm afraid I'm going to break that airline. All right, now as I'm removing these bolts, you can see in this picture here two things. Number one, look how much lower the uh, studs are that the bolts uh, are on. That means that the air strut's compressing a little on its own. Uh, but most importantly, check out the amount of slack we have in that airline still. That's gonna be just enough that we can uh, bring it down below this bracket and remove that airline without it having a ton of tension on it and possibly snapping. All right, this last nut's ready to come off. I am uh, supporting like a snow cone, the bottom of the strut with my hand. There comes that nut. And I'm gonna start lowering this guy with the use of the jack if necessary. So I just have enough clearance to get in here with my wrench and remove that airline the rest of the way. All right, as you can see here, I got the airline fitting out and now uh, we are completely free. It's easy just to lower the jack down, which allows us room to wiggle this air strut out. Just like that. All right. Now you may be thinking, instead of taking all that effort to remove this fitting, why not just clip the line if there's enough slack and start over again? Well, let me show you. Right here on this line, there is a manufactured like ring going all the way around it. And so if you were to clip it, then you would have to clip it at that ring and start over up here. You'd have no real guide to tell you how far you've gotten into the new fitting and you're gonna lose quite a bit of the slack you had before. So you're better off to be careful, leave that in place. We're gonna push this fitting out of the way and then there's this little crimped piece around here and it's got a slit on one side. We can get a flathead screwdriver in there and pull it off, just like that. Now we can get this fitting off. Oop, let me support it up here. Good. Find a semi-clean portion of my dirty rag. Let's take a closer look at this fitting. So included with these air struts is the new brass fitting and then also that new little compression fitting. See that? And it's tapered inward. That goes up towards the compression fitting. So all you have to do is have this fitting already in there. Make sure the O-ring isn't squeezed out or anything, right? You remove this little shipping plug and then your airline presses straight in there and engages on that little compression ring and it's held tight and that's all you have to do. All right, I got the new air strut set in place. I have the jack down there hoisting up the uh, lower control arm so that we have just a few inches right here uh, before these studs here get inside of this bracket. I've got one of the brand new 15 millimeter nuts sitting right here on deck saying, put me in coach, I'm ready to play. I'm gonna with one hand lift up the air strut and with the other hand, I'm gonna get up here and push in the air fitting. And once I have it seated, I can grab the, the nut and start bolting in at least one of these to hold everything in place. All right, we're all set. If you had a pair of those really long needle nose pliers, I've seen some videos where that's quite helpful. I don't have those. I just have a normal pair and I've got them right here in a little hole in the frame in case we need them. See if I can push it in there. Oh yeah, that went in real good. Real good, all right, sweet. Putting the 
first nut in hand tight. All right, these two here that are accessible from the front are in and hand tight. I'm gonna get up over the top with my uh, extension and get this other one going. But first I wanna just bring my fingers in there and try to get it started. Oh, oh, I can get it started with my fingers. Good. All right, coming up over the top from the engine bay to get that third one. Now my smallest torque wrench won't even fit in here, but if you got one that does, these are 42 foot pounds. So you want that little ring bulge around the hose to be about two quarters stacked in height away from the brass fitting. So not like this picture, but like this picture. So if necessary, make sure you're getting in there with a pair of pliers and seating that air hose properly. Now it's time for the bolt to go into the lower control arm and the bottom of the air strut. As you can see, there's the hole right there for the air strut and here's our lower control arm. So we're gonna use this jack and bring those two together. Nice. All right, let's secure the nut on the other side. And this gets tightened to 221 foot-pounds. Whew, that's a lot. Let's put our heat shield back in. All right, wheels back on, vehicles lowered down. I put all the fuses and relays back in. Let's raise her up and then we'll do another overnight test. Pitching. Look at that smoke coming up from the driver's side. That's new. I wonder if that's from spraying cleaning products on something yesterday. All right, we're all the way raised up. Let's pull some fuses and relays and let her sit and see how it does. So I went around and took measurements of all four wheels from the center of the hub up to the trim. And every one of them is just a little bit different. So we're definitely gonna need to calibrate. Well, the overnight test was very successful. In fact, it's actually been a couple of days and all of the heights have stood firm, which is great news for us. That means we no longer have any links. And now it's time for the calibration. And to do that, we are gonna be using the Gap ID tool. I did have a comment in one of the previous videos asking what exactly that is. It is this little guy right here. It's an OBD reader. It pops right into your OBD port underneath the uh, driver's area. And it talks to a tablet like this little iPad here via Bluetooth and with it, it unlocks all sorts of capabilities when it comes to dealing with uh, Land Rovers, Range Rovers, and I think Jaguars too. It's, very, it's specifically made for those kind of vehicles. And in my opinion, it's a must have unless you wanna go and pay a couple hundred dollars every time you wanna have codes cleared or uh, ride height calibrated or adaptations cleared and set in the transmission and all those sorts of things. Believe me, you're going to want one of these. So because this channel is all about obsessing over details, I did take painter's tape and found dead center of each of the wheels so that when we take our measurements, we can be as accurate as possible. After all, they are going to be down to the millimeter. And speaking of millimeters, it's going to be very helpful to have a tape measure like this one here that not only has inches, but has centimeters and millimeters for this particular process. 
And to continue our theme of obsessing over things, I have found that when I'm kneeling down and doing this with the tape measure, oftentimes I can't quite tell what is uh, straight up perpendicular to the ground. So since I have this yellow T-square, I decided to go ahead and uh, put that in place for each one to kind of keep my measurements in line. All right, only thing left to do is pop all the fuses back in the system. We need to start the vehicle up and get it from where it is now, which is off-road height, down to the standard height. That is where you do your calibrations with the gap tool. So let's do that now. All right, you can certainly leave the engine running. I turned it off just because it would be so loud for the recording and we're already pumped up to uh, full capacity. So I think we'll be able to make these small adjustments without the engine running and the need to kick back on the air compressor. Okay, so the first thing we want to do with the gap tool installed is go to calibration, then suspension, and then you have a choice between manual and guided. Let's go with guided and you'll see why here in a minute it's a little easier. Proceed with this routine, yes. All right, so as you can see here, it's talking about how we're gonna be measuring from the center of the wheel up to the uh, piece of trim. So we're ready to do that. All right. Uh, it's going through all of the uh, instructions here that you can read. We're going to start, as you see, on the front left corner, and that's where we're at. All right. So, uh, starting at the front left corner, we want to be, as you can see here, 466 millimeters. Oh, and it also gives you the inches. Look at that. Cool. All right. Right to our center line, straight up to the trim. And we are at, hold on. It looks like we are at like 476 or so. So we're quite a bit high. Let's come down just by pressing the big arrow button, the down arrow. Hear that? All right, let's see how many that got us. Ooh, wow. Got it right away. Okay. So the next thing we wanna do is press next and it switches us right over to the front right for us here, the passenger side. All right, 466 again. Let me set my tape measure and we are at we're at about 462 so we're going to raise that up that's good we'll hit next and now we are going back behind us here to the right rear back here at the right rear it's gonna be fun taking all these stickers and little things off when we start working on the body and cleaning up everything. All right, so back here, we are at 485. So the back is up at standard height a little bit more. So 485 millimeters, we are We are 475, so we got a ways to go. And good. Last one, left side rear. All right, last one, 485 millimeters. And this one is spot on, nice. So we hit next. Then we go to apply. Proceed with this routine, yes. Now it's updating, operation succeed. Push the EAS up or down to reactivate. Let's do that.
and we should be good. Now, just to be thorough, I've gotten in, started the car, raised it back up to the standard height, and I'm gonna go around and just check and make sure that uh, all those measurements are the same. All right, well, I thought that went pretty well. Now, I will stress that you need to be seated in the driver's seat or at least have access to the height control inside the vehicle at that last little part where it's doing that six second countdown. Otherwise, it times out and it doesn't take. So, little tip there, I had to go back and redo it again. But overall, I thought that worked out great. Now, believe it or not, we're still not even done yet with the air uh, system because right Behind this panel here in the very back is the air inlet filter. So the air leading into the air compressor is filtered up here. I wanted to take that out and, and show you how to clean it, but uh, we are going out tonight to get the Christmas tree and then all weekend, we are in Mesquite for my daughter's softball tournament. There's just not gonna be enough time. So I wanted to get this video out this weekend and we're gonna to have to end it here. If you found it helpful, will you please give it a thumbs up? It really helps the algorithms to start suggesting it to more viewers like you. Also, please consider subscribing. If you see this stat right here, over 95% of people watching these videos aren't even subscribed to the channel. We could really, really use your help. It's free. You just have to be logged into YouTube. You hit subscribe. Or if you're on Rumble, you just hit follow. It would help out a lot. Now I'm gonna leave links for everything we talked about in this video. Full disclosure, those will be Amazon affiliate links. So if you click on them and end up making a purchase, it won't cost you a thing, but I do get a small reward at the end of the month. It helps to justify all the extra time it takes to make these videos. Speaking of these videos, the next one, we are finally gonna get on the road since we now have the transmission service, the leak from the coolant system fixed and the air suspension fixed. We are going to go out in a pretty uh, remote area of Las Vegas and we are gonna calibrate the adaptations on the transmission. In the transmission video previously, I said that uh, you could just drive it around for a few weeks like a granny and that would take care of it. I had a couple folks reach out that I'm gonna highlight in that video and give thanks to and show me that there's an exact procedure for how you wanna do that to get the best results and the smoothest shifting as soon as possible. And that's gonna be our next video, so until then, Thank you for watching.